Welcome to episode 310 of the Motorsport 101 podcast, powered by Honda? Roll titles. Well, apart from Formula E, because they're not in that series yet. But anyway, hey guys, Stray here. Welcome to episode 310 of Motorsport 101 here. And uh, the most, shall we say, diverse episode of the show we're ever going to record, because we have four individual series all featured in this week's episode. We'll be covering Formula 1 at Paul Ricard, which, oh my god, for the f- a couple, like, not for the first time I've said this this season, A good insert country here Grand Prix. We had a very good French Grand Prix. I don't know how we got here, but we we got All y'all doubted me. All y'all doubted me. (laughs) We were... I hate that he... I hate that he's right. We we were right to doubt you. We should have doubted you, but Mercedes screwed the pooch. Wait... Look what you did, Mercedes. You made King smug. Ugh, I, I don't like it here. Look what he's done. He's, oh, dear. But yes, yeah, so we had a very good French Grand Prix. We'll be talking all about that and the strategy call heard around the world. We'll be talking MotoGP in Germany as the king returned to claim his throne. We'll be talking IndyCar at Road America, where Joseph Newgarden's gearbox decided, um, nope. Um, at the end in uh, stunning and awful dramatic fashion. And we'll be talking Formula E in Mexico where um, a guy got disqualified as he was crossing the finish line. No, seriously, that happened. Um, And that's barely scratching the surface on all the series we get to cover over the course of the next hour and change or so. But with me, as always, RJ O'Connell. Hello, sir. Honorable mentioned Nire Fukuzumi for winning the Super Formula race and extending the Honda dominance of the weekend at Sportsland Sugo. Oh, yeah. Even, this even, this even is a good, good weekend for Honda. This, this <laughs> is like the best weekend for Honda since they dropped the first generation NSX. Straight out of Ayrton Senna's shed, where he personally hand-welded all the parts of the chassis. Not everybody knows about this, but it's true. (laughs) It's never mentioned. It's never mentioned. Um, Also, we have some interesting milestones to talk about real kick as well. Because uh, a small round of applause, celebrating his 300th appearance on Motorsport 101. It's Ryan Eric King, ladies and gentlemen. Hello, Ryan. Good to see you, yeah, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Gl- glad I, I made it to 300. Um, yeah. Uh, I hope, hope I'm here for 400. Uh, I, I, I might get caught out or just miss a ball and it'll hit the wicket, but I, I hope I'm here <laughs> by 400. Yeah. And let it be said that Ryan Eric King has reached the unreachable star. Now with as many <laughs> podcast appearances as Donnie Schatz has World of Outlaws main event victories. Shout Chris DeHarnay was that. begging for us to get that in the episode somewhere, and we did it just for him. See, Chris, that's for you. Um, just let everybody know, I got I got petty beat by wide margin. <laughs> Kyle. <laughs> <laughs> Kyle, you never touched me. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Kyle Petty's 200 wins! <laughs> no, Very Kyle true. Bush. Bush, I'm calling you out right now. I like where this podcast is going. We're getting Kyle Bush called out. I mean, this, this, this is great. Just, just just, keep the milestones rolling in, quite frankly. But congrats to King on his 300th appearance on this show from the very, very start of, of Motorsport 101 back in 2014. Um, back when we were, we were recording Skype calls with an MP3 device. And uh, uh, this was still a university project. It was a strange time back then. I was a lot younger and a lot less fat. But here we are. But uh, well, good times indeed. And uh, yeah, congrats. We've also got another milestone to celebrate as well. Because it feels just like yesterday since he joined us, but this is already his 100th episode on M101, our newest edition, Cameron Buckley, ladies and gentlemen. Happy 100, sir. You may raise your back to the pavilion. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't know why you retain me. I feel like I just am kind of screaming into a void. Um, But you give me the platform to do that, and... um, 
I, I'd like to thank everyone from this dark corner of the screen because a very particular cloud is sitting right in front of the sun outside my window. <laughs> Shout outs to you, Cloud. Um, 100, 100 appearances. Um, Lewis, up yours. <laughs> so Carl Bush, Lewis Hamilton, anyone else you want to get off your chest today while we're still here? FIA um, race control. Yeah, fair, fair, fair. Uh, there's always time for that. Whoever yeah. designed that cursed image of Suzuka, but it doesn't overlap on itself... Mm. Move on, move on. We don't need to talk about it. We don't need to talk. <laughs> what about are we it. talking about today, Dre? Uh, what are, what we, kind of stuff do we have to play? We, we, we have a lot to get through. We got, we got to, we'll get right to the housekeeping first and foremost. Right, so basically, you can find us. We're on YouTube.com forward slash Motorsport One Hundred and One. If you're watching us on YouTube, hi! Thanks for joining us. Subscribe, hit the bell, it would really help us out. Uh, much, much appreciated if you do that already. If not, you can subscribe over there to get full video releases on the podcast, highlights, and a bunch of other stuff as well. We're on Facebook.com forward slash Motorsport One Hundred and One. We're on Twitter. Uh, motorsport underscore 101 with the follow our personal handles you can at harrison 101 hd at rj o'connell at ryan eric king and at c buckley 917 um if you'd like to follow us on instagram you can at motorsport 101 pod um and if you really really like us you can back us financially on patreon patreon.com forward slash motorsport 101 five dollars gets you early access to all of the audio editions of our show you can upgrade to ten dollars for the video versions and the supporters club of our discord server where you can listen to these episodes live as they're being recorded you can find all those details and much more on our website motorsport101.com <coughs> So, as I said, this is a quadruple stacked burger here, folks, of, of, uh, of series to talk about. We've got F1, we've got MotoGP, we've got IndyCar, and we've got Formula E all on the bill over the next hour or so. Yeah, just, just keep we'll start. stacking it up. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's like Wendy's. You just, you just keep adding layers on top. It's great. Um, so, yeah, to, top, to start us off, let's go to Formula 1 at Paul Ricard for the French Grand Prix. The first episode of this... Seemingly Honda-sponsored special, the French Grand Prix. <laughs> and it was a French Grand Prix of pain for Mercedes, after a poorly executed strategy with Red Bull led to Max Verstappen chasing down Lewis on the penultimate lap after they converted to a two-stop and Mercedes stuck on the one-stop. Mercedes were the first to blink on a tire change after Valtteri Bottas had flat-spotted his tires, with the team openly admitting that they underestimated the power of the undercut some three seconds a lap in the hands of Verstappen, leaving Hamilton out for two laps longer, and when he came out of the pits, Verstappen just pipped him into turn one. The race calmed down a little bit, but with concerns for multiple drivers about the hards making the end, and the Red Bull this year historically being a little bit harder on its tires over the course of a race than the Mercedes has been, Red Bull pulled the trigger for a two-stopper to, quote, pull a Spain, return the favor, and run Hamilton down. Sergio Perez ran long on his first stint to make his own one-stopper work, have enough tire life at the end, and pass Valtteri, what was it, with a lap to go? To claim P3 yep. and Red Bull's first double podium of 2021. Mercedes admitted that they misjudged the race, apologizing to Lewis after his second place. And Valtteri Bottas was angry on main, saying, quote, Why the fuck did no one listen to me when I said this race was a two-stopper? Fuck. So. Oh, boy. Did Red Bull win this race or did Mercedes lose it? <coughs> and They won. <laughs> I'm, I, just, yeah, I'm just going to cut yeah. in. That and if the I'm latter, cut in and s how big of a screw up was it? I was going to cut yeah. in. Red Bull won this race. I don't see any viable strategy that ends with Mercedes winning this race. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Valtteri Bottas. Even if Mercedes <laughs> won a two stopper, neither you or Lewis were going to win this race today. <laughs> really? Um. So. It's 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 a strange one, right? Because yeah. 
I didn't realise I bought us a flat sport in a tie, and that's what started the chain of events that led to Verstappen yeah, coming out in front after the first round of stops. When, when he got up behind Verstappen and when was trying to pressure him, when he went off, I think in uh, first sector, that's when he that's when he beat up his tires. Mm. Right, right, right. Now, <sighs> it, it's easy to look at it and just go, "Well, you know, Red Bull pulled a reverse Catalonia on them, basically." Like. I'm I'm not sure I agree with King on this one. I think Merckx could have won this race. I I, I I think they got a little greedy, and I thought they took advantage of Bottas' flat spot to try and get him in front of Max and go for a one-two. And I, and I think it wasn't beyond the realms of possibility that they could pull off a one-two finish here. Yeah, um, if you believe in the think, power of dirty air, you're probably thinking Hamilton holds this lead that he got because Verstappen botched the first sequence of corners on the opening right. lap. You're thinking right. at that point, right, this race is done and dusted. We can go home. We can go off to go uh, continue to sleep in or go out to the stop or whatever. But no, it didn't play out like that. I uh, I agree with King and not necessarily due to how the pit stop mm. played out um, later in the race. I, as the track rubbered in, Red Bull went with a very low downforce setup, gave them great straight line speed, made the cars a little bit trickier. We had rain that washed all the rubber off the track, and the Red Bulls were very tricky in the first stint. That showed when Verstappen went into turn one, lap one, lost the rear of the car with a, a, a couple of oversteer moments, and uh, fell behind Lewis. As the track rubbered in, Red Bull's pace was ridiculous. Um, even after Lewis had, uh, pressured Max for a few laps, he started to drop back after the, uh, during the second stint. Mm. I think the bigger concern was Red Bull trying to cover off Mercedes potentially pulling a Spain again and sending Lewis back after him with the Mercedes known to be a little bit kinder on its tires. <clears throat> and I think... They didn't want a repeat of what happened last time out, where uh, Verstappen had a surefire win taken away by a catastrophic tire failure. And they brought him in. And he not only had the pace to run them down, he, he had time to spare. I think it would have been I think it would have been a bit more convincing, which I think would have also generated less of a firestorm of a reaction on the internet. If it wasn't for the fact there was one a lot of traffic during the race, and and I think that was probably a big part of the problem because France is a track where half of it you can't overtake around. There's a lot of medium speed corners and a lot of cars that could get in the way of that. Um, and it did. Valtteri didn't help himself there at the end of that race either by basically defending against thin air. Um, yeah, which he uh, his... didn't exactly help either. Fair enough, Verstappen was way faster on his fresh tires. You couldn't hold him for a corner, Val? A corner? He overcooked it. He, he overfought it. I, I I, think he thought the attack was coming when I don't think it was actually Max already gave up the breaking corner. I think Max... Yeah. I think, yeah, I think Max was already too far back to, to, to consider a passing attempt, but Bottas defended it anyway, overcooked it, basically put two wheels off on the inside and then completely compromised his exit. And that's what opened the door for to make Max go through easily. Yeah, and Almost it, it a- compromised his exit on a straight into a flat-out corner in a portion of the track without a DRS zone. All he had to do was just stay out in front and he was going to hold the position for at least one more corner. Yeah, you had to be really optimistic to make moves and do scene and Lebose. I mean, granted, Lando Norris did a little bit of that, but that was that's a different scenario I th- early in the race. I think Mercedes, and they've made this mistake a couple of times this year, it feels like they're trying to build their strat- their strategies around the idea that their car is still overwhelmingly dominant when it's just not. Lewis can't no. pull a fastest lap of the race out of thin air on supposedly dead tires. Bono, my tires are dead, intensifies. Um, to make a strategy work, whether it's protecting from the undercut, which Verstappen got, he closed three seconds of a gap in one lap. Yeah. Um, 
in, and Merckx admitted it themselves to Ted Kravitz in the middle of the race that yeah we underestimated the undercut and that's why they're in the hot water they were in to begin with <laughs> yeah and I think even yeah. then Red Bull was just in the second half of the race as the track rubber and Red Bull was just too fast for Mercedes to make the one stopper work when the Red Bull was too quick on its mediums I think even if they all match each other I don't see how they get around Verstappen again this is this is like this is the Red Bull that we've wanted to see for so long in this triple hybrid era. All that bluster, and now it's finally come together. And now I believe that they are the odds-on favorite to win this championship at the rate that they're going, at the rate that they're they winning. The they have both cars on the podium, three wins in a row, which hasn't happened before in the turbo hybrid era before for them. Oh, and I think of I look at it. Go ahead, Drew. I look at it. I saw the cut you got in there. Yeah. Um, with the bookies, Mercs and our favourites. I'm oh, sorry, sorry, Rebel. sorry, Rebel and our favourites. Max Verstappen is now four to five odds on favourites to, to win the championship now, well, ahead look, of Lewis Hamilton. This track was a Mercedes apogee two years in a row. They annihilated the field in 2018 and in 2019. They never, they never lost in the world championship era in France. Never. As a, but, as a yeah, full and Hamilton had led, led all but yeah, and Hamilton, I think, had led all but one of the previous two years' racing laps on that track. This is why this it was complete annihilation. This race was so important because this is a Mercedes stronghold. This, if you were going to build, mm-hmm. if you were going to build a track around what the Mercedes is, this is one of them. Front limited circuit, lots of medium to high speed turns, straights. Red Bull thrashed them in qualifying with Max. Mm. And were, tell you what, a couple years ago, if you told me a Honda was drag racing a Mercedes Benz in a straight line, I would have laughed at you. But that's what we saw this weekend. They were four or five miles per hour clear every straight yeah. between their rear wing and Honda. You hear that engine noise outside? That's the VTEC kicking yeah. in on uh, Sergio <laughs> Perez's engine. And it made, yeah, the, but... made the pass for the win relatively easy because... Max got up behind Lewis, wound that Honda up, and just blew right by him. To the point where Lewis didn't even really Easy. bother defending it. He knew it was done. And when the when when the roles were reversed, like Hamilton just could not find a way around Max, despite being able to run in his dirty air zone within half a second for the majority of the lap. Yeah. Um, so it goes to show you how far Red Bull has come. And fun fact, the last three races since the infamous Catalonia two-stopper that Hamilton put out, Mercs have lost 66 points to their purple colored rivals since then over the last three just, rounds. It, They've gone from leading both championships to now losing out heavily in both championships. Now 37 points back in the constructors too. It feels like almost the full race behind. It feels like Red Bull was a little bit unfamiliar. They 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 had to get used to fighting for a championship again. They had to understand some things with their car that was absolutely as quick as it is now, but burned up its tires a bit. Had some <clears throat> just little issues. And if this is what mm. we've got for the rest of the year and Red Bull just pulled one pulled one off of Mercedes at a stronghold, I don't see how Mercedes pulls it back. Because there's the ever-looming shadow of 2022. Neither of these teams can wind up their R&D machines and go at each other's throats. Not without compromising next year. And... I wouldn't put it past them to bring a few more little adjustments here and there, but it feels like Mercedes' hands are tied here, and it feels like Red Bull has yeah. all the momentum. Yeah, I mean, you really want to sacrifice R&D for next year and potentially let McLaren or Alpine or Aston Martin or Ferrari back in the door? <laughs> Ferrari, back at the door of championship contention. <laughs> yeah, uh, side note, Ferrari had a terrible, no good, and very bad race. No points. Awful. Um, no points. Especially no, 11th and 16th. Le- Leclerc had a bad day at the office. I like the angle that mm-hmm. this win was Adrian Newey avenging 1990 at Paul Ricard <laughs> when, his car- when his Leighton House almost won with Ivan Capelli only to cough it up at the last minute to Alain Prost. Finally, Adrian Newey gets revenge for 1990. Sweet. Things that have literally oh, never dear. been said before. <laughs> <laughs> right. But, uh, yeah, Max. First time for everything on this show. Yeah, Max now leads the championship by what is it? Uh, Thirteen points. 
believe so. 13 points. Um, pulled, pulled maximum points from this race, fastest lap and the win. And if they, if Mercedes, I'll, I'll put this in writing. You can come back to me on this. If Mercedes doesn't win two of the next three, they're in big trouble. Because we have two a, of the next three are in Red Bull Ring, Austria. Oh, cool. yeah. Because if we've got a little bit of everything over the next couple of races, if Mercedes doesn't find some performance, it, it there's no real way for them to put away Red Bull. It will be having to rely on Red Bull folding, whether it's reliability or Max making a mistake. Yeah, and, True. you know, I don't see Max making any mistakes as a oh, driver was... at this point. Max, Super good. Max has changed this year, and I, th- I think he's th- he's thinking a lot more. I thought at the end of yes, uh, of Sunday's race that he got past Baltas, his tires were done. Lewis conjured up pace out of nowhere, out of his dead tires, and started holding Max back. As it turns out, Max was just cleaning up his tires for one last run and caught him with a lap and a half to go. Yeah. And that is not something Max... It all just fell into place for Max on the line. That's not something that Max from 2018 or 2019 would have done. He's learning when and how to attack. And that's a scary prospect. While we're wrapping this up, do we think Botas is kind of checked out at Mercedes... Because I, I felt like this came up in a chat I was having, uh, or that I was observing uh, during the race. Because I didn't, admittedly didn't get to watch much of it, but hearing that rest of the radio, somebody brought up that, like, you know, this sounds like a driver who kind of knows that George Russell is going to be replacing him next year, but they're just trying to, you know, make sure that they give him enough time before they announce it, so that way it's not in his head. I, mm, I don't know. I would say, I wouldn't say he's checked out. But he's in a situation where it feels like he knows every result he has matters. His back is whether it's the wall. him staying, yeah, whether it's him staying at Mercedes or him securing a seat somewhere else post Mercedes, yeah, he yeah. knows people are gonna be looking at his results and seeing what can Botas do for us. Indeed, and in, in terms of raw pace. I think this might be the best on paper that Valtteri's looked all year. This in Portimao, um, he was good certainly here. more than certainly more, yeah, certainly more than Portimao in that ballpark where he led a good chunk of that race. But this was probably the most competitive Bottas has looked all season, especially in race trim. And you know, to a degree, he what he bit the big bullet when Merck screwed up on strategy, and then at the end of the race, he wasn't boxed for a fastest lap attempt either, and. Um, Bottas was one of the first guys to point out on the radio that this was a two-stop race, or he felt like it was a two-stop race, and he felt like he was ignored. And well, that's always going to be frustrating when you factor in the elements that King mentioned. Like it, just, it feels like it's not going your way, and then the guys who are meant to help you are not helping you, rightly or wrongly. He's going to vent. I think. I feel um, like that venting was the sign of somebody who does care. But go on. I, I, of course he does. I think it's actually the other way around. It feels like Bottas is doing everything he can. And this race, he I, he was absolutely right to complain. He was left out there to try and salvage the win for Lewis after Mercedes got, as you said, greedy trying to go for a 1-2. They didn't have the car for it. And it, it left both drivers out there on tires that were just not up to scratch. And Perez, who and Perez is real. Perez at Red Bull is real. I'm mm. so glad he uh, he ran down Bottas. He blew right by him, and yeah. that was on a Are you one. Sure, stop. we're not talking enough about Sergio Perez's title hopes. Tell you what, if he learn if he learns how to qualify that car, ho oh, oh. ho. Yeah, because that's the <laughs> that's the issue. He's consistently pretty poor in qualifying. But the last three races, he's been phenomenal. You could yeah. you couldn't ask more given Excellent his position uh, for for Sunday. Yeah, they 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 committed Perez to the long one stopper on that race, and it and it worked to perfection. That was the best they could have gotten for Perez on the day, and it worked. And the tire was was the big victim in that. Yeah, and yeah, the the the, the, the managing your tires is what made it work. That's why besides how Seb came up the field and finished in ninth as well on the day. Um, no, look, I I. I, a part of me feels bad for Valtteri because I've, I've said it on this show over the last few weeks. I think people 
I think his bad days get exaggerated to a degree on the internet, because I know a lot of people just want to see George Russell in that seat, regardless of what the results say at this point. Mm-hmm. And I can understand why. Russell's an exciting talent, and he's a great driver. And Russell did well this even, weekend. Like, again, this, was, this, was, this was his best race of the season, ironically, where he finished in 12th on the road from a bad start. And... It jumped him ahead of Haas on countback. Yeah. Yeah. It's very so was a big, a big weekend. Yeah. Big weekend for Williams. And, you know, it's like every time Bodas has something go wrong with him, it's like we don't take him seriously on the internet anymore. So I kind of want him to do well just to stick it to those people a little bit. Um, and this was this was not the race to dunk on Valtteri for if you want to talk about him and his future in that seat. I think he had a pretty solid race. And I think he was let down by his team today. So I can understand the frustration because if I was in his seat... I know I probably wouldn't be very calm about it either. I'd be straight upstairs too, um, well, at best. Well, the problem is <laughs> now, I'm a hothead. Now it's swung around where Mercedes could all Mercedes could always exploit one Red Bull being in the fight. Bottas was in the fight here, but now we've got two Red Bulls. Now Perez is consistently beating the second Mercedes. Hmm. Mercedes now has a world of work to do in the constructors because suddenly Red Bull doesn't, they're not just scoring with one car. A double podium, and I see um, i see double podiums coming thick and fast for uh, Red Bull. I as, see, as I Perez see two of them in the next coming weeks. <clears throat> <clears throat> definitely, definitely. And, and we all know if, if, if Mercs don't retain the constructors' title this year, who do you think is going to get the. the portion of the blame here it's not going to be number 44 no um certainly so, um and for better or worse um so yeah uh i do feel a bit bad for valtteri on that one um i don't think this one was on him um and uh yeah mercs they've got work to do and uh they're now going to be on red bull's home soil with a very very fast car to beat good luck with that one guys um should we talk about gp <laughs> oh i got a mid dre I did not see this coming. In a million years, I did not see this coming. Uh, I look. I I make no bones about it. I'm a huge admirer of Mark Marquez, and even I, as an enormous Marquez fan, I was starting to to believe some of the people that were saying he might not ever be the same dude ever again. But after 581 days. Since his last Grand Prix victory. Back at Valencia in 2019. To top off probably the greatest season this sport had ever seen. Mark Marquez back in the winner's circle. And and I loved Steve Day's call over the line. And still, the king of the ring. Mark Marquez uh, with his 11th consecutive win at the Saxon Ring. Going back to 2010. Um, his eighth top flight win in a row. It was a superb performance. It was a stunning performance. It was a, it was a, it was a bit of a time attack race in the end. It, it was a, some very light rain we had in Germany. There was always a minor threat of rain in the area. It did actually have a little sprinkling, but not enough to have a major effect on the race. Um, but it was a intense fight between Mark Marquez and KTM's Miguel Oliveira and. By the way, man, he is on fire at the moment right now and on that on that KTM post chassis change. Second, Hot like the fries at the second. bottom of the bag, baby. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. Six sixty five out of the last seventy five points from Miguel Oliveira in the last three rounds Tell you KTM's what. fuel and chassis change. Tell you what, if he mm. keeps that up, Fabio better be looking mm. over his shoulder. Yeah, he's uh, white hot at the moment on that KTM. And again, he ran Marquez about as close as Jonas Volga did a few years ago. Uh, um, got to within a second by the end, but just burned up his tyres a bit too much, trying to stay with Mark. And Mark broke him with about three to go. We had Fabio Quattararo as well, who, again, another champion's ride from Fabio. Yamaha was nowhere this weekend, still got on the podium in third place. A very important podium. Extends his championship up to 22 points as well. It was an incredible, emotional victory. You could visibly see Mark crying multiple times on the track. His brother, who was already taken out of that race by the little Petrucci, was one of the first dudes to congratulate him. Um, He bear-hugged the team. He cried when the Spanish national anthem played on the top step of the podium. (sighs) 
this might be Mark Marquez's greatest win of them all. I mean, and, and he's had a few, to say the least. Reasonably successful, right? Um, <laughs> reasonably. Uh, 80, 80, 83rd career win. <laughs> I mean, 57 in the top flight. You just laugh when you, when you run some of these numbers off, but... Uh, Gentlemen, what did you make of that one? I I never dared to dream. Uh, you know, a couple people who who, we, who we've mentioned on the show as, as uh, content creators that we like with MotoGP kept saying, "Mark's gonna win this weekend. He's just gonna. He's never lost here. He's just gonna win." And Mark countered that, saying, "You know, my pole streak ended. He qualified fifth. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow, my win streak is going to end. We are not here to win. We being Honda. Yeah. Yeah. And well. over the course of the season, Honda had shown no evidence that they want to win. Hell, we were starting to talk up the possibility that Honda were going to tank the rest of this year for concessions. That they didn't right. want well. him to get 11 in a row because that was the only one away. They were going to get concessions to fix their fundamentally broken bike. Well, whatever thoughts of doubt we're going through Mark's mind, clearly went out when he put the visor down. He barreled into turn one, got second, passed Alicia Spargaro doing the Lord's work on that Aprilia to uh, fight Barry for the lead. Alicia Spargaro got a whole shot in Aprilia. Yeah. <laughs> we got nothing. Um, Mark Marquez led every lap. He won lights the flag. He won lights the flag I, 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 after after I breaking did. his arm so completely that it put him out for a year. Multiple surgeries. Uh, God awful motorcycle. I mean, this place suits the Honda better than yeah. anyone else, and no other Honda was even in the ballpark come qualifying. Yeah, no. Paul was nowhere. No, no, Alex was no, no, nowhere. No. Nakagami tried. Um, threw it, wrong tire. Yeah, threw a hail mary with the tire. Could make it work. And it was Mark Marquez operating in flashes. You see him on lap one, and you think that looks like Mark Marquez. But the big moment for me was when we had a little sprinkle of rain as he was leading just ahead of Alesh, and the gap that was fluctuating about four to five tenths blew out to a second and a half. And then blew out to two seconds. We didn't know it at the time, but that was the race over. Yeah. Like, we, like you're not going to gun Marquez down that hard at the Saxon ring, even even in an injured state, even with one good arm. I mean, yeah. Jack Miller himself said after the race, he's got one good arm and he still came down and smoked us. <laughs> um, <laughs> which I thought was funny. Yeah. Um, it's... That's, you, you watch him, and you watch him in the second half of that race, and M Miggy, he's so fast through the corners that don't stress his injured arm. He's pulling a half a second in the first part of the lap through the left-handers. And then in the right-handers, he started losing. And then he started losing more than he was gaining relative to Oliveira. And then the gap got, the gap got under a second. I'm sure Mark looked at the pit board. And drop the mother of all hammers. Yeah, mm -hmm. I. It was. He hasn't. He just. We can't beat this guy. It's it's funny because Mark said after the race, he said that it was about lap five when the rain did start coming out, where he said, "I'm winning this race," because that's what apparently what he said after he said, "As soon as it started raining, I was like." I'm winning this and nothing is going to stop me. Um, and he must have been fighting through the pain barrier. I mean, Gavin Emmett said on the, on BT Sports coverage in the UK or during that final lap that he's still on antibiotics for this arm. Yep. And that the doctors have told him that it could still be another 12 months before he regains the muscle memory he had in that arm. He's not going to be 100% for a while, folks. Yeah. Like, there is... No getting around this. And we mentioned it on the show. We mentioned it a couple of weeks ago. Miguel Oliveira has been on fire for the last month. He should have won this race. Any other scenario, he wins this race easily. Um, and that's... M Miguel was as good as anyone has been at the Saxon ring against Marquez in the last half decade. And 
he bullied Oliveira into submission on yeah. the final yeah, five he laps him. of that race. He, he baited Oliveira. Rest, it felt like he was resting that right arm a little bit for one last push. Mm. As soon as Oliveira got close, Mark pulled a second on him in a lap. Yeah, it's ridiculous. What's the Marquez? We what, know what do we? Ha- what is there left to say about him? <laughs> that he, he's. I've said it before, and I will say it again. He's the biggest freak talent I've ever seen in motorsport. Two wheels or four. Yeah. I've there, there's n- like I've said it before, and I'm not the most richest man in the world. But when God created Mark Marquez, He created one of him. Yeah. There is no one is else one of one. like this dude. He is a true original. He is one of one. And when when you see your bug, again, shout out to Lewis, who's working the social media on MotoGP, our man here. I, I saw a video on Instagram they put up there earlier this afternoon talking about it. They were you're like, when the other riders are talking about how great that performance was, like Johan Zarco, who's always had a wave of the arrogance about him, Francisco Bagnaia spoke of it, the, the Jack Miller quote I just mentioned about it, he's got it one good arm, he still so smokes us. <laughs> um, oh. You know. Miguel Oliveira was like, no, I, I knew I didn't really have a chance here. Um, but God damn it, he tried. They all talked about how special this one was. And even I've seen some of the most hardcore Rossi nut huggers come out and say this one felt special. And uh, it, yeah, this was proof. It, it did. It was. It's proof going forward that if he does indeed regain his full physical self, and maybe if Honda gets off their ass and finally improves this terrible, no good, very bad motorcycle. Look, Mick Dewan almost lost his leg in 1992. Should have lost his leg. Mm. He came back with a flexing leg because the bone hadn't set correctly and still walks with a limp from that crash. Mm-hmm. He won five world championships. He beat everyone so bad in the late 90s, he convinced everyone that the 90s had no other good riders. Yeah. I think Mark's going to be He beat everybody okay. so bad that they convinced them that the 250ccs and the 125s were actually the premier category. <laughs> <laughs> he's the he guy did. He's the guy who primed Valentino Rossi said, I've seen his data. He's fucking fast. Right. And uh, Mark's already be okay. won more than he ever did. He's going to be just fine. And, At least I don't think he's just fine. And you know, another he, thing as he, well. he might win again before the year's out. Yeah. Another thing as well. Mark Marquez had none of the usual swagger after the race. None of the dancing on the bike. He was just thankful of everyone who got him here yeah. and of the chance to continue doing what he loves. He spent a year without it his one true speech. love. <laughs> hmm. He thanked everybody. He thanked the academy. It was a, it was a it was a true Oscar speech. He thanked everybody that got him back to that point, and it felt special. And it was special. And hey, good news, Mark. Coates is coming back on October. October. Oh 6th. God, no. <laughs> <laughs> Paul. That's right. Paul. He's going to nice. avenge twenty nineteen there too. Paul. Um, Paul. <laughs> Mister Spark, you were never getting concessions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But there was one other big storyline that came out of the Saxon ring, and unfortunately it was at the other end of the field, and it involved one Maverick Vinales. Yes, that name again. Um, Of all the bikes that finished the race, Maverick Vinales was last over the line. He qualified in 21st, and he pretty much stayed there by the end of the Grand Prix. Um, That was already shocking enough as it was. But uh, then, after the after the race, his post race debrief, he let off some scathing remarks towards um, the situation he's in at Yamaha, including quote, he feels he's he's getting a lack of respect amongst the team. He scoffed and cited frustration at the suggestion that hey, do you want to copy Fabio setup and maybe go from there? Given that Fabio's the only rider on Yamaha doing well at the moment. Um, he scoffed, he, he, he scorned, he pulled scorn on that idea, and uh, he even insinuated that he may have dropped back on purpose during the course of that race to, quote, test the bike. Um, it's, it's a scathing, it was a, it was I've an never, eye bar, it was I've never heard of Ryder talk statement. about the factory like that. Even Rossi in his darkest Ever. days on the Ducati, he never spoke of the factory like that. 
Well, remember when Rossi did that a couple of years ago and Yamaha actually apologized to yeah, him? Yeah, because all because like, everyone just, on a Yamaha was saying it. Fabio just got a podium. Yeah. Yeah. So the question I ask to you gentlemen here is, is this the point of no return for Maverick at Yamaha? Yes. And if so, where next? Yeah, because like the way he's phrasing, like the way like, oh, I drop back on purpose to test the bike is saying that, oh, oh, I'm not the problem. The bike's the problem. And he's framing it in a way where it's like he's trying to sell himself to other teams where it's like, no, no, if you guys give me a good bike, I'll be competitive. Don't worry. Look, it's that works if your team is nowhere. That works if no one's winning on your bike. Fabio Quartararo is absolutely the championship favorite, unless Miguel Oliveira continues being hotter than the surface of the sun for the next few months. Um, Go KDM. <sighs> I I don't see a way back from this. When when you're that yeah, when you're it's got it's got to be hard to imagine where this could escalate from here. Like. I saw Joel Embiid insinuated that his number one draft pick teammates, bad free throw shooting, cost them a shot to advance to a conference finals of basketball. Thank you for tuning into our That's basketball That's because it podcast. did, because, ben, <laughs> I don't because ben Simmons isn't a good basketball player. Moving on. <laughs> that is... That is the cost to go past. Jeez. Um, is this the Ben Simmons Hell's Angels game? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Philly's coming for me. Philly's coming for me. <laughs> Moving close. Sorry, right, just, remi- right. just remind them that they had Carson Wentz. Anyway, you can't come back from this. Because if you're, if you're saying that you are deliberately throwing what little result you might have to, quote, test the bike, if you're calling out your engineers... And if, once again, Maverick Vinales is the king of hypotheticals. He's the king of the race on paper. He has speed and nothing else. If he can't break away, get into a rhythm, and ride completely unchallenged for an entire race, he's one of the worst riders in the field. Which is very aggravating of someone of his talent level, because he has the talent. He's shown it. He's proven it. Uh, Yeah. Only two men in this field have more wins in the top flight than Maverick Vinales and there. Number 46 and number 93. And yet... Maverick Vinales, has nine top flight wins, and that's... His, and that's kind of the problem. He has nine top flight wins in seven years. Yeah. And he's had factory bikes his entire top flight career. When was his last win? <sighs> Started this year, right? right. Yeah. Feels like... Qatar, Qatar 2. Feels like it was five years ago. It, it couldn't feel any more removed from how it is now, and... He's always had this problem, but it's just seemed to have gotten worse and worse. And when you're when you're th- publicly throwing your team under the bus, there's not much way back from it, especially with a company like Yamaha with a very rigid corporate structure. And uh, mm-hmm. you know, don't 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 speak ill. We'll try and fix it behind the scenes mentality. It's. <sighs> I, it gets frustrating to talk about Maverick because it's not like Yamaha have not done him any favors or not thrown him a bone. He's gone through three crew chiefs. He just changed crew chiefs two years. races ago. Yeah, he, he, he's brought in Valentino Rossi's old crew chief. He, he, he drove out Ramon Forcada, who single-handedly has helped Frankie Morbidelli in his career since going Which, over to oh, SRT and helping him. Frankie, uh, He's had three different crew chiefs. He's had mm. many, many petulant rants at the state of that team. And it's like... It's, it's the double-edged sword of he's won nine Grand Prix, which is the third most in the field, but he's only won nine Grand Prix in seven seasons in the top flight. For a We're guy that was touted as a potential Marquez stopper, the Marquez stopper, the other young, talented Spaniard... The guy who Mike got on the in. Yamaha in 2017 and beat the field black and blue to start the year was riding away and mm. destroying everyone, race after race, and then it just stopped. And yeah. now he really hasn't got an excuse now because Fabio Cotteraro has got into that team and is now t- championship favorite with nearly a race of points in hand. Is making is making Vinales look like an amateur. 
yeah, it, it, it's over. I, 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 I'm, I'm thoroughly of the camp of, I think Yamaha might swallow their pride, buy out the rest of Vinales' contract, because he's on a two-year deal at the moment. He's, he's there till the end of next season. Um, they signed that deal before the 2020 season had even started originally, um, or, or, or where it was going to start before COVID hit. Um, that was, I think this was back in February, because he lives in Qatar now. He wanted that deal wrapped up quick so he could focus on his riding. And now it's an anchor of a contract because you've got a guy that clearly doesn't want to be there. He's you, stuck on a two-year deal. This discourse can't it might con- just buy him out. This discourse can't continue for another year. And the problem for Yamaha is that the guy they could have very easily slotted right into that seat and said, well, F. Vinales and F. Patronus SRT, with the rumors swirling around that team, uh, Frankie Morbidelli destroyed his knee in a training accident. Again. And is out for at least Assen. He'll be replaced by uh, the American, Garrett Gerloff. Yeah. USA. USA, USA or something. So, USA. I mean, when you were... Frankie Morbidelli's on a two-year-old bike where he's having to ride at a near superhuman level to get any lap time out of it. Yeah, and he's beating the snot out of Valentino Rossi, who looks like Valentino, he's going to be done at the end of the season. And going to GTM in WEC. Speaking of Valentino Rossi, he was the second best Yamaha this weekend. He was consistently 12th, 13th, effortlessly outpacing Vinales on the full factory bike. Watch Vinales win Assen in a fucking canter. Now that we've just gone through all this He's done it before. This yeah, he, he, he has like, done it like before. That, like we, he, he did it the last time he raced it two years ago. It was one of the few races Marquez didn't win. But, and but it's, Vinales broke but away and Marquez was like, nope, can't touch him. You can't, you can't <laughs> peak and trough like this. You can't be the best rider in the world one weekend and, be, and produce your worst result in the top flight the next. It's not sustainable. Yeah, like it's it's not sustainable, and for all the talent in the world, he is a fundamentally flawed rider. The problem with Yamaha now is is that if they bring up Frankie Morbidelli, you put your you put your satellite team in the shit because Rossi is probably retiring at the end of the year. It's not official, but there's already talk he's going to try and get into the WEC next year, um, and they've not got much in reserve. With Patronus, yeah. you're looking at their number one option is Jake Dixon. Which is great for BT Sport. <laughs> you got a Brit in the top flight again. Woohoo, nationalism. But, uh, he, oh, but he's not as British. Oh my god. But he's regressed compared to the end of last season. And it's, and then it, or it's Xavi Vierge, who is uh, pretty middle of the road as a veteran in Moto 2. Um, they might bring up John McPhee to Moto2 to force somebody's hand, but there's controversy over that as well because they promised McPhee they're going to bump him up for a year and a half, and they haven't yet. So uh, Patronus is a mess right yeah. now. They took, a, they took a punt on a year of Rossi. It's not worked. Um, if Maverick doesn't end up there, maybe a prettier? I don't, I don't think Good so. God. I, I, no, because oh. right, it, it's, it's worse than Zarco at... It's worse than Zarco at KTM because Zarco was pu- publicly critical of the bike. He wasn't out here slandering his crew and the management of the team. And that yeah. that, that ride yeah. ended. Zarco's done well for himself since. If you're Aprilia right now, mm. you have Alicia Spargaro doing the Lord's work on your bike. And you have potentially Andrea Davizioso waiting in the wings for a factory seat next yeah. year because the Aprilia Why actually ain't too bad. Vinales? You don't. And I fail to see how anyone... I, I don't want to see Vinales fall out of the sport because he's proven he is that good on his day. But he's got to get these character flaws out. who's somebody aside? Nobody. Hang on. Hang on, hang on. A, a prospect. Hmm. What if Suzuki moved out Alex Rins for him? Because Rins is having a dreadful season, and when it and we found out going into this weekend that uh, apparently that, that incident with the cycling was him texting while riding. It did not go down well. Texting while all. riding on a bicycle right into the back of a van. 
Yeah. He's lucky he didn't get himself killed. Monumentally stupid. He's lucky he mm. didn't get himself killed. Um... Yeah. Depends what Suzuki sees in him because as as we know, he was there before. He won with them before when they were just still finding yeah. their feet in the sport. But do you try to bring in Vinales or do you try to bring in a prospect from the lower categories who you believe is your future? And we're talking about someone who's I, I, very I think, young in Vinales. I honestly honestly I don't think there is a, a prospect worth taking on in Moto two because the top two in there right now is blatantly Gardner and Fernandez and they're both probably gonna end up at tech three next year. Uh Good news for King. He's got like four quality riders in the top flight next year. Yeah, KTM's <laughs> like, looking good it's, right it's now. It's disgusting. They're, they're eating good. But uh, good luck breaking down that Mavericks Vinyana situation, especially because uh, City Season was looking bland this year for, for, for bikes. And uh, it could get spicy if Maverick Vinyana's hits the open market. More on that soon. RJ O'Connell. IndyCar in the gearbox blown. All o- heard all over the world. G- right. hit, me, hit me with it. IndyCar. Joseph Newgarden, we're at Road America. Joseph Newgarden has led 32 laps out of a 55 lap race. Alex Polo is the only dude that can live with his speed for most of the race. He had this win in the bag until we have a restart with two laps left. And then Joseph Newgarden starts the pull up the hill, down the home stretch, and then all of a sudden his momentum stalls out. Polo blows by him before they even get in the first corner. His car is stuck in fifth gear, and then he has to cry, grind it down in the first gear to finish the last lap, slower than what he drove under the pace car. So Alex Polo wins his second race of the season out of Colton Herta and Will Power, and Pat O'Ward finishes down in ninth, which is decent, but not what you want when you have a one-point lead, which gives Polo a 28-point lead with seven races left in the season because we won't be replacing Toronto. King, is it time to call your man out, Polo, the title favorite? Is it now a two-horse race between him and Award, or can the veterans gun him down with Ditson 53 points out, Newgarden 88 points out? Remember, after Indianapolis, I said, Alex Pelot's title chances are going to depend on how well the next three races go. And we've gone through... Well, three races. One of them is a little rough. The other two, pretty well, good. <laughs> pretty good. He now has a win in hand. Uh, he's not going away. This is, he's not going away. He's not going away. No. They're over halfway through. He's, stu- he's, he's lost a little bit of a margin. It was 36 after Indianapolis. It's still 28. Considering the race um, directly after think- Indy, he will take that because he was nowhere with the oh, yeah. the, the, the grid penalty, mm. basically scoring no points. He's undone most of that damage. <sighs> Oof. Because the thing, like, Pelo, Pelo won this race. Pado was a little bit below par. I think, I think it was down in 8th. Um, nice. Dixon, the, the Dixon very quietly did his thing where he just doesn't do anything worth a damn in the race, but still finishes in fourth. And you don't even realize, like, you just turn around and you realize, wait, Dixon's in fourth? <laughs> How did that happen? Yeah, he's <laughs> and, one of the um, few dudes that started on the uh, the primary tires and uh, one of the few dudes that finished the race on the alternate tire compounds. This was another race where the primary seemed to be the meta tire. Polo went. Uh, primary tires all the way to the end of the race actually finish it on a scuff set and f- set his fastest lap on them, which is wild to think about. You know what else really impressed me was Romain Grosjean. My dude was elbows out like all day. Oh, he looked this like, is, like this he looked is, like prime sorry. Lotus Grosjean, just making those decisive, low margin, high reward moves and making them work. R- yeah, that, like this, like Mister, I take no shit to Romain Grosjean. That was fun. No, look, I, I, I did the maths on it. If New Garden had won that race, he would have been minus forty two. He mm. wasn't. He's now minus eighty eight. That gearbox going into emergency mode cost him four. It was a forty six point swing, almost an entire race's worth of points. Um, eighty eight with Penske being out of form. I, mean, I still it's can't Penske believe we're over halfway form. through. Penske's not won a race. Penske <laughs> aren't out of form. They just keep losing in increasingly ridiculous cartoonish ways. Yeah. 
It's ridiculous. This is the longest. The racing gods into... of like fuck this. You bought, you <laughs> so bought the, the series. No season. conflict of interest here. <laughs> it's the longest they've gone into a season since without winning since 1999. A year that started with Al Unser breaking his leg one corner into the season and a cavalcade of misfit replacement drivers. That came in until an old Al Unser Jr. was ready to come back, and then announced he was going to that to that other company out east, brother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, west or wherever it was. It's, That's how bad it was. Like it's Penske, like, I have hmm. I have confidence they'll win, but it's just getting wild. It, it feels like we were getting ready for a uh, second half of the season, New Garden, to make his usual charge, and this has put an end to that. Right in the crib. Uh, I don't know. There's still enough time left. Well, it, it's not where... so much that New Garden can't. I believe that New Garden, if he really wanted to, could win every remaining race this year. The problem yeah. is, Polo just he just ain't going away. He, it's like he's on the top yeah. five every weekend. Yeah, because Polo is kind of what you expect the big three teams to be doing, always in contention, and when. Someone slips, they're there to capitalize, and I, as as much as they made gains over, you know, last year and so far this year, I don't think, you know, McLaren could really be up there alongside Ganassi yet. No, I, Pato has the flashes, this, but he doesn't have that consistency yet. Like, as this title fight, you know, goes on... I do think Dixon's going to be more of a threat. Penske will break through and get a win, but I think we're going to start seeing Aero McLaren SP slowly fade. I'm not so sure about that, to be honest. And it's not because I want to see another team like actually make a legitimate effort to try and break the triopoly that we have at the top of the championship chain. Award looks has been just excellent this season. Yeah, he, he didn't look so great in Road America. No, but that's not the thing. Like he, when he's good, he is he wins. When when I, when Patricio Award is good, he wins the race. But when he's not, he's 8th, ninth, maybe a little lower, maybe a little higher. Yeah. Polo, if he's not winning the race is like 3rd or 4th every week. He's pulling a Scott Dixon so on Scott gateway. Dixon. Yeah. Yeah. We got Gateway coming up. That's a race he nearly won twice last year when we had two gateways. Mm. But it's it's the youth movement is here, folks. Oh yeah. And Colton Hurd's Hurd has got to be wondering, like, damn, why ain't I up in this? Because <laughs> Andretti stinks. <laughs> yeah, because as much as we say triopoly, it's it's Andretti right now. It's a duopoly. It's now and, become a duopoly. Andretti has fallen from that that third slot, and. uh... How many, how many of the different... Uh, I think every driver at Penske is going to be a full-blown drinking buddy by the end. Scott had a bad weekend. <laughs> Pagano qualified well, had an issue in the race that just robbed him of any and all speed. Yeah. Uh, pain. And now this is Will Power and Joseph Newgarden. Newgarden losing two pretty much surefire wins in a row. Power losing mm-hmm. um, a pretty comfortable one. At Detroit won. Ouch. Got a, got back on the podium uh, this weekend at Road America. Oh, and by the way, we're 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 obliged to mention Matt Chilton got Carlin back in the top ten. What? I don't get it. Either. Sometimes you know a broken clock is twice is right twice a day. <laughs> it works. No, like I I can't disagree with much of this. Like we keep looking for a hole in Pelot's game. At the moment, there isn't one. It's 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 as simple as that. He's just this good. Um, he's got an excellent package around him. The chip cars have all been excellent this season. Um, all all Polo except one. Is, yeah, well, another yeah. all except one. But that one that one car got a win. No, I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about the chocolate the the the, the, the chalky oh. car. Oh, John, oh no, Johnson no, 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 no. had another I, really rough weekend. Oh, I did it again. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, King. 
300 Ooh, episodes, he's still finding his fate. <laughs> nah, the go, Motor- okay. Yeah, the 48 mm. clearly belongs to Hendrick Motorsports still, clearly. Of course. Yeah, this, this is just going to become a running gag yeah. where I just completely forget. Jimmy <laughs> Johnson is in a cadaver. How could you for, how could you forget? How could you forget with all how those Carvana you advertisements? Last week we were talking about how NBCSN wouldn't shut up about hyping up this dude. <laughs> And uh, what I, makes I, it like, hurt? Uh, 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 what makes it hurt? Editor, I, need, I need a montage. Of, I need a montage of all the moments King confuses of Jimmy Johnson for for the NASCAR. I need all of them in a shorts <laughs> on YouTube immediately. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going viral. Yeah, <laughs> and, um, what makes it all the more rough uh, to to touch on it for a moment is that uh, Kevin Magnuson had a pretty solid. Weekend in the car, all things considered. Uh, engine grenaded in the race, but up to that point, he was doing okay. Oliver Askew. Woo-hoo. There was a minute there oh. we thought he might win this thing. Yep. So unlucky. Yeah, they were just able to get the race going with two laps to go at the end, but Askew was, was, was waiting and waiting for a caution that came about a lap after he went into the pits. Mm, unlucky sum. Yeah, um, two super subs, that's, that's, uh, and Johnson was still not not good. Not good. Uh, ah, well, we, we're getting there, Jimmy. Come on, Jimmy, get it together. <laughs> we're rooting for you, Jimmy. Uh, t- but uh, hey, that's 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 IndyCar for you. They'll be back next weekend at Mid Ohio, Dixieland. Well, that's that's bound to be fun. Um, King, I think Formula E done um, did it again. I'm, I'm, um, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> Good luck with that one, buddy. When so we, remember when we were talking after the first race in Valencia, like, this is the darkest, bleakest moment in Formula E's history. There's a legitimate argument to think, wow, this, all, this just got topped and we're only, like, a couple of months removed. Yeah. Uh, the the last time we saw a shocker this large around the city of Puebla was the time the Mexicans defeated the French and on on the fifth of May. Uh, I see. <laughs> but yes, <clears throat> Formula E has returned to Mexico this time, not in Mexico City at Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez, but in the city of Puebla. Well, not a street circuit that we're used to. It was a circuit around a permanent course. A permanent oval, nonetheless. A the road Roval. course at an oval. A, ro- a Roval. Roval. The Roval. And uh, the story of the weekend, you know, besides, you know, fans returning for the first time, us having a, a Joker lap at attack mode, uh, the the circuit literally crumbling under the tires. The story of the weekend was one Pascal Verline who uh, had a tremendous performance in both both races on the weekend. Race one, it seemed like he was going to win the race in somewhat dominant fashion, as dominant as formerly he can be. Uh, but in the late stages of the race. Message from race control appears. Car, uh, car ninety nine under investigation for a technical infringement. Uh, it's, like, uh, it's like, huh? Hmm. Yep, there is no explanations why. Uh, people just started speculating, it's, and uh, we didn't get a definitive answer until just as the race ended to why Pascal was under investigation, oh. but. But we learned why as we got the decision. And the decision was that Pascal Verline was disqualified from the race, giving the race victory to Lucas Degrassi. Uh, oh, Lord. This is the second time that Pascal Verline has been victimized to Louis- Lucas Degrassi's benefit in the country of Mexico during his Formula E career. And it continued on. Race two, next day, seems like Pascal Verlein is set for a solid second place finish. Same thing happens again. Pascal Verlein under investigation for power overuse. 
post race, not only post race, but post podium. Uh, oh yeah. Verline learns he's under investigation while in the media pen because he was asked about the penalty, and that was the first event he's ever heard of. Oh. And we, then we, we, were, we, were, we were joking as the race was going on. It's like, is the Michelin man in the background going to tell him? Oh, like. and, and then later that day, he's given a five second time penalty, demoting him off the podium in the fourth place. Uh, and just to quickly circle back, the penalty in race one was given to him for uh, a failure to declare tires for the race. Uh, basically. Formula E race operations boiled it down to, yes, we did, we do have and see the tires in our system. It's just that Porsche didn't hit the button to declare the tires for the race. And, so, uh, yeah, oh. it's, it is, uh, is a tough pill to swallow. A lot of people were frustrated by this. I was frustrated by this. Uh, Me too. Formula E chairman Alejandro Gag was frustrated by this. He said that he wanted to kill somebody. Uh, oh, he's damn. not the only that's a, one. That's a, that's a quote. That's a that's a quote that gets you hard locked from Twitter for twenty four hours. Damn. Right. Right. That, that's why. That's why you say it as a quote to to a member of the press. And Let somebody else can, take that bullet. <laughs> they can tweet it, and then they're fine. They don't get put in Twitter jail because it's not them making a threat; it's someone else making a threat. Uh, so they're in the clear too. That's how you get around going to Twitter jail. What lesson for everyone at home? But yeah, uh, it this this seems like and the second penalty a very the second penalty was not actually for power overuse. What it was, was Pascal receiving fan boost and leaving it late enough in the race, because he was not trying to, trying to fight for the lead, that when he activated it, his car didn't have the state of charge to support the power increase and refused to use the extra power. I... Caramba. <laughs> I can't remember. A weekend, maybe in my 20 plus years as a motorsport fan, where one man was this unlucky. Like, this, this is just... There was, it was completely out of Pascal's hands. All of it. Yeah. <laughs> and he had a podium taken off him and a guaranteed win taken off him. I... Through yeah. no fault if, of his own. If it <laughs> wasn't for the penalty in race one, Pascal Verline would be leading the championship. <laughs> and now he's in 12. And, and, and this would have been huge for Pascal given it is so close in Formula E right now. There is literally we have a handful of points covering the top five at the moment. And that would have been that would have single handedly saved Pascal's pretty miserable start of the season. And it essentially counted for naught. He's back in the midfield again. I proposed and, this uh, question before we started recording. If you're Pascal Verlein at, at that point after having the win taken away, or even after getting demoted off the podium, is there is there like a, a, a nerve in the back of your mind that thinks, I, I should quit this series right away? No matter yeah, how under, much Porsche under is normal paying. circumstances, <laughs> probably not. Because that's not, this is not how racing drivers are wired. But in these yeah, circumstances... No. Look, 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 full disclaimer, biggest Porsche nut hugger. Oh yeah. King of them. The biggest. King Porsche simp here. Why is a paperwork error that is easily checkable on the grid to see which tires they have on That gives no competitive advantage out on track. Worth a disqualification. When it is clearly not even worth officiating in person to the FIA. 
Yeah. That aspect of it it's seems fun. completely fucking asinine. Yeah, and I, f- I feel like I'm I'm fine with the penalty, but what I'm completely aggrieved by is how loosely it's monitored. If 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 the penalty is a disqualification, this infringement should be monitored. Yeah. On the, the same beam. level that yeah. the penalty is a disqualification. You should treat this as if they're trying to tamper with the tires, which means yeah. you're, inspe- you're you're you should treat this seriously if it's worth that much. And it it clearly isn't because the fact that it took that long into the race for them to realize it, and and the fact that they ran the whole it. race, let him cross the line, and then booted him out. Yeah, when. You're you're in the rules. You're supposed to declare tires ten minutes before the race even starts. What happens? Yeah, if you see that they they aren't declared, you send someone down to Porsche. Yeah, what what the fuck's going on? Declare your tires. You don't you don't let them run the race. That's why the penalty is a disqualification. Because in yeah. every other series, you don't get to that point. Yeah, they, they'll yeah, part, they right. won't. Verline let you run. wasn't the only dude hit with it, but Verline was also the dude that should have won this race. Yep. Yeah, and in the second race, I mean, and uh, the second, I don't even know with this penalty because it feels like fair play to Eduardo Martara first and foremost yeah. for for just crushing it lights to flag like that was great. Yeah, Ver, no, he and Verline were in a completely different league. Um, yeah. and he ended up even regardless of what happened with the penalty, uh, Verline made a mistake. He was not going to beat Martara regardless. Mm. But he had, he had second. He was gonna have. Second. He was gonna have a win in second place, and this is Pascal Verline passed someone. King, he passed yep. someone. Before you were getting somewhere, and said he wasn't. <sighs> what? It's that. <laughs> what that tells is fan boost is mandatory. Effectively, is what's that saying? And even if you use it, and your car doesn't let you use it, you will get a penalty. No, but like Cam, I don't know where you heard that explanation of his penalty, but it was it it was given for power overuse, as in, uh, mm-hmm. you know, you, you hit a bump. At, so it was while he was on fan boost, but he hit a bump at a specific moment, and basically, it there is a a very, 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 very brief power spike, and it went above the fan boost limit. And that's what triggered the the overuse penalty, something that is completely out of his control. Uh, That it was pretty much down to just software. I'd said, uh... I'd seen seen that on motorsport.com, so... I don't know. Yeah, Yeah, fair enough. Ugh, no ideal at all, and it should never have to come down to a point where that car was allowed to race, and it should never have gotten to the point where, literally, as he's crossing the line, we found out within seconds of the race being over, he's been DQ'd, and then they cut the... to literally Audi jumping up and down for a one-two finish. I've got, it I've was, got the FIA it was bulletin. To watch. I've got the FIA bulletin. <laughs> That the technical data showed that the driver activated the fan boost, but due to the low remaining energy in the car, the minimum power of 240 kilowatts was not reached. The technical data then showing that the maximum energy of 100 kilojoules were were not completely used. Oh. That's that's straight from Mm. an FIA bulletin, so... Yikes. So... A, 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 a boost that is given by the fans that will only happen to a quarter of the field is now essentially mandatory for those cars that use it. No, but, but it wasn't just it mandatory. Was he used it. His no, car prevented him it. It from using it, and they penalized right. him. That's just... Yeah. How does that make sense? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> That's an easy, easy yeah, way to so, explain it. It doesn't make sense. So, yeah, it, it's... You have to use it for uh, a set period of time. So basically, you just have to activate it once. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you don't have to use it for the maximum amount of time period, like allowed, but there is a minimum amount of time, and you never use it for the minimum. 
because the car wouldn't let him override because the car thing, the car software said you don't have enough power to do this, so I'm not going to let you do this. I would much rather talk about like how we're sizing up to have a yet another close, unpredictable championship battle where it seems like everybody can win and nobody can pull away. And it's going to go on right paper, down the wire. But we're not, Look, but we're not but it's like on paper, this is fantastic. But there's a driver who could have been in this championship scrap who isn't now. Look, yeah, yeah. I really like Formula E. The racing's great. The cars look cool. They sound cool. The drive. They've got tons of drivers from all different backgrounds. A lot of great personalities. But uh, after weekends like this, when people say that Formula E isn't a real racing series, quote-unquote, that it's like real-life Mario Kart, they're not that far off. Because when you get past the core racing product, these, these things tacked on and these things that the FIA enforce more by proxy than by actually going out and regulating them, get in the way of what is fundamentally a fantastic series. And we're left talking yeah. about the bad aspects of it rather than the great on-track product. Because Mortara and Verline had a great scrap for the win. Yeah, because from the outside looking in, it comes off as the FIA had to cut so many corners to just allow a racing series to basically have a one-day show and have as minimum officiating staff as possible that they created situations where where the winner of the race isn't determined by what happens on track or by you know what people consider as silly gimmicks but just simple like legalese and regulation that's just and it. red tape you use the it it mm. feels like it's racing by it's racing by legal terms Rather than it feels like what people think Formula One is whenever their favorite driver doesn't have a good day. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, hello, Lewis Hamilton Twitter. Bad luck. <laughs> uh, it's just <laughs> aggravating. It it, it, it's aggravating because it got in the way of two races that had good on track racing. This track was actually a lot of fun. More rovals. Yeah. yeah. Even maybe even think, now, maybe rethink the exit of the uh, attack mode zone. Yeah. Right. But other than that, I mean that was fun. Yeah. Okay. I like that. Wish we were talking about how fun those races were instead yeah. of you know like, all this <laughs> other bullshit. <laughs> the races were very entertaining. Uh, obviously, though well, some drivers didn't like it. Like Jean Eric Verne hopes we never come back here because he did not have a good weekend. Uh, yeah, no. because besides the. Uh, the attack mode exit, which a lot of the drivers found as being unsafe, which, I mean, they were right. Uh, a lot of the surfaces were literally falling apart under the tires of the cars where they're it's like... like yeah, yeah, these... Yeah. yeah, where it's like people assume, oh, FE cars are slow. No, they they corner pretty quickly. Yeah, well, well and even mm. these aren't really... These aren't downforce cars in the sense, and they don't have slicks. So imagine how bad the surface would have been if we were in, like, a higher tier formula car than this. Um, yeah. You know, the track layout itself was pretty great, but the facilities, something to be desired. Incredibly frustrating. And King, um, are we going to be able to go to the Brooklyn E Prix? Because that's next nice on the calendar. So I'm pretty sure right now at, at time recording, there are currently no tickets available. At time of release, we're probably still not going to know. Because uh, apparently, uh, for for Puebla, tickets went on sale for that race the week of the race. Uh, and it seems like if, if fans are allowed to come to New York E-Prix, it'll be the week of the race. We'll find out or not. Oh, yeah. Because, uh, I don't know. If we can... Uh... Yes, I know. He- I, mean, I know. Trace, Hendrick Motorsports Trace just, just got out. a new vice chairman, Mom. Jeff Gordon, <laughs> new uh, new vice chairman of Hendrick Motorsports. But uh, if tickets go on sale, might cat might catch you at the E Prix. 
maybe. maybe. See, we'll have to see what happens. Um, Dre stepped away. Dre stepped away. Uh, you know, thankfully, hopefully this time uh, when King and I try to hang out in real life, there isn't a de- deadly pandemic. <laughs> Yeah. Dre has left the building like John McAfee. Oh my (laughs) god. (laughs) On other news, Dre has left the building like Oliver (laughs) Rowland. Yeah, Oliver Rowland out at Nissan in at Mahindra, probably. Yeah. If you believe the hyphen. It's (laughs) the hyphen are usually right about this. Yeah, they're well connected. Uh, It's, uh... I wouldn't say it's unexpected. No, uh, I think a lot of, a lot of people are confused because they only got one half of the story. It's like, oh, Oliver Roland's out at Nissan. Why would Nissan get rid of Roland, who's been performing well and not Buemi? And it's like, oh, you think you think Nissan let Oliver Roland go? No, no. Yeah. Roland's and, and, leaving. Yeah, and even then, like Sebastian <laughs> Buemi is responsible for like 97 percent of Edam's successes, and that. And one thing that Nissan is is like loyal to a fault to a dri- to some of their drivers. Yeah. Mm. In, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Dre. While we were away, we broke the John McAfee story. <laughs> <laughs> the John McAfee story, and my yeah. mom texted me. Uh, yeah, Jeff Gordon. Vice Chairman of Hendrick Motorsports. Never Ooh, saw that coming. Bad luck, for, bad luck for you, Mike Joy. You're stuck with Clint Boyer and Clint Boyer only. Fate worse than death. But yeah, the lineup at uh, the the potential lineup at Mahindra is looking pretty good. Mm. Uh, don't know who Nissan are going to get to replace Oliver Rowland. Daniel Kvyat. <laughs> if you're smart, it's Daniel if you're Kibia, smart, Daniel number Kibia. one of the bullet. Yeah, yeah. Not not Alex Albon. Okay, May, maybe. I uh, think that ship has sailed at this point. Maybe, uh, maybe Valtteri. Wait, wait. We're completely off. I was like, we're completely off the album wagon. Then, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is all the bonus content that's been cut while during the restaurant break. Yeah, maybe. Uh, <laughs> wow, this is getting cut. <laughs> maybe, maybe Valtteri <laughs> Baltas if the season keeps going the way it is. Oh. <laughs> Well, you don't need to no, manage if, these tires, uh, Valtteri. Valtteri. We don't change them. If Valtteri's, le- if Valtteri's out of F1, he's not going to FE. He's he's probably going to World Rally Championship. Oh, boy. Back into the Sebastian not- Auger grinder he goes. Yeah, oh, like, Congratulations. You get to be new Kimmy. Yeah, hmm. and the thing is, Val- Valtteri Bottas is not that good at rallying, guys. No. <laughs> I was going to say, like, he's not a great rally driver, so why would he do that? No, because that's not even the point. The point is that Sebastian Auger is never going to log off. He's going to (laughs) keep winning championships until the day after the end of days. I can't believe we've entered our second season in a row where OGA says, this is going to be my last season, everyone. And then we're not even halfway through the season. Guys, I'm coming back next year. (laughs) (laughs) Guess what? Guess what, guys? Something came up. If you can beat me, if you can beat me, I'll leave. And he still ain't (laughs) leaving. It's the final episode of Yu-Gi-Oh! all over again. It's like, the Pharaoh can't go home till he's beaten. (laughs) I honestly thought he was just going to win the world championship and just leave. It's never that simple. Just like motorsport. And that's why we're here. Look, Chip Ganassi likes winners. Sebastian Auger likes winning. Yeah. He ain't ever going to stop. And on that note... Let's get out of here. Um, a hectic week, to say the least, but a, but a fun one to break all down. We'll be back next week. We've got the first of two Formula One races in Austria, the Styrian Grand Prix up first. Hinted talk of rain on Sunday. Just from that way out there. It's, the it's, it's, it's still Wednesday. It's still Wednesday, <laughs> but like, yes. it's ra- we need there's, light. there's rain <laughs> predicted for Friday, for Saturday, for Sunday, and for Tuesday. Mm. So let's say, a, c- come back to me Thursday afternoon. Then I'll believe you. Hmm. Okay, we'll come back in about twelve hours time. Uh, and then in the, in the meantime, yeah, we got the first of the, the two F one races at Austria, the Styrian Grand Prix. We also have MotoGP at Assen, which is weird to say it's going to be on a Sunday this year. But here we are, MotoGP at Assen, the Dutch Grand Prix. Oh, well, look, look, 
if if you're not normally a MotoGP fan, Aston is one of the best races on the calendar. And it, it's it's, it's not it. it's not the Dutch Grand Prix. It's the, it's the Dutch the, TT. The, sorry, sorry. I know somewhere I, I Lu- killed. Yeah, by, Lewis, by, by Lewis Sunby. <laughs> Lewis Sunby is loading the gun now. <laughs> the granddaddy of them all. The Dutch TT. Uh, look, look, it's one of the best races MotoGP puts on all year. Go out of yeah. your way to see it. It will be. If, if, if the field is still this close, it is going to be insane. Go watch it. Go you will not it. regret it. Um, those are the big two. We'll be, we'll be talking about both of those on next week's show. Well, basically, you can find us in the meantime or on youtube.com forward slash motorsport101 or on facebook.com forward slash motorsport101 or on Twitter at motorsport underscore 101 and our personal handles at Harrison101HD at RJ O'Connell at Ryan Eric King and at cbuckley917. Uh, we'll also on Instagram at motorsport101pod and you can catch us um, as well on Patreon if you want to back us financially on there, patreon.com forward slash motorsport101. We'll be back next week to talk about Formula 1 in, in Austria Part 1 and MotoGP for the Dutch TT. Um, until then, I've been Andre Harrison, they've been RJ O'Connell, Ryan Eric King, and Cam Buckley, and until next time, sayonara. Later, y'all! Bye! I don't know how I'll ever recover from last weekend's Formula E event. <laughs> I don't how think much, we ever will. How much ever clear you got in the fridge? Not enough.